Eleanor Williams' claims that she'd been trafficked by an Asian grooming gang led to protests, racist attacks and claims of a cover-up. Eventually, she was jailed for lying. I don't want to be that girl that cries rape. I'm not that person. I'm Sky News' Jason Farrell, and in Unreliable Witness, we ask, why did she lie? And explore unanswered questions with new revelations. Follow Unreliable Witness wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Neil Patterson. Welcome to the Sky News Daily, where, in a break from the norm, we've actually got something positive to report for once. We've had good news. Inflation has come down. Uh, it's come down as we expected. But we have still got some way to go, particularly with what I call the more persistent bits of inflation. That's Governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, bringing the welcome news that inflation, the rate at which goods and services increase in price, is down to 3.2%. And that is the lowest it's been since September 2021, raising hopes that soon the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee might start to cut the interest rate and give a little help to borrowers. And yet... Despite this good news for the economy, as always, it needs tempering with the bad. Retail giant ASOS has seen year-on-year sales drop by 16%. Beloved British brand Superdry, which went from a market stall to global fame, is now delisting from the stock exchange as it attempts to avoid heading into administration. So, is the government's economic strategy paying off? And are they right to take the credit for the improving economic outlook? Later, we'll be taking a close look at the retail sector with Russ Mould from investment platform AJ Bell. But let's dig through the numbers with our economics and data editor, Ed Conway. He's taken a break from hassling central bankers in London and is instead hassling bankers in the United States for a bit of a change. Uh, So, Ed, where where exactly are you at the moment? Because clearly it is not the office. No, it's not my office. It's the office of the International Monetary Fund. I'm in the Ah. kind of big atrium, so you can hear people kind of coming and going around me. This is, if you're talking about the hub of international economic thoughts, it's right here. This place was set up, I'm not going to do a long lecture about this, don't (laughs) worry, but this place was set up 80 years ago at the Bretton Woods Agreement in in 1944. And basically it's a place where different finance ministers can get together and try and work out what's going on in the the global economy. And the interesting thing is that, so we've obviously just had UK inflation numbers out, they're down, but they're falling less quickly than expected. And it's this kind of a similar story in the US as well. So, so US CPI as well is kind of ticking up around the world elsewhere. You definitely have this sense that while inflation is coming down, while people are like tentatively a bit relieved here, definitely that's part of the message from the International Monetary Fund. Mm. There's still a bit of nervousness that the job's not over yet and that and the inflation is, has, has not gone away by any means. We haven't slayed it, is I guess what all the central <laughs> bankers, and they're, they're all here, what they're kind of nervously talking about. But Ed, allow me to be just a little bit parochial, just for a second, and focus on the situation in the UK. Uh, Andrew Bailey, of course, announcing that inflation is coming down, but I suppose we should acknowledge the fact that whilst it's down from 3.4 to 3.2, there was an expectation that it might have come even lower than that. Yeah, there, there was. I think some economists thought 3.1, some thought even 3%. So it's a tricky one. It is going down. Um, but what matters just as much as the fact that it's going down is whether it's going down as fast as most people expect it to, because that in turn informs the decision from the Bank of England about what they're going to do with interest rates. So, you know, up until recently, I'd say there was, there was a decent chance that people thought that there might be a rate cut in the May meeting, OK? So in, interest rates currently 5.25%. Some people thought that maybe the bank, which has already hinted that rate cuts are potentially coming, the fact that this inflation isn't coming down as quickly means that's much looking much less likely. And a lot of economists think the earliest likely one is potentially August, could be even later still. So that's, you know, that's higher interest rates for longer. And right now, those interest rates are causing a lot of pain. Yeah, and, and, and just in terms of the reason for inflation coming down, certainly looking through the figures, cooling in terms of food and drink inflation, we, we have seen a drop in household gas and electricity bills. But on the latter, I mean, that remains pretty volatile, doesn't it? And if, for example, we were to see a, a bump in, in, in you know global oil prices, you know, we could start seeing inflation creep back up again, couldn't we? Well, yes, yes, that is certainly true. It's worth saying that the way that obviously, as we all know from from the last few years, the way that our bills behave is 
they move with a bit of a lag. So we've got this price cap. Essentially, you kind of know in advance where they're going to be heading for the following quarter and then, then they might bump up. And as a result of that, we have a pretty good sense of where inflation is likely to head in the next few months. But broadly speaking, they do think it's going to fall in April and actually fall quite a bit. So the annual rate, and we're talking about the annual rate at which prices are increasing, getting down to around 2%, maybe even below 2%. And it's been interesting here in the US. And it's, it's so fascinating how similar the conversations are there than they are that I have in the UK with people. You know, they, people say, OK, fine, economists say inflation's coming down. I don't feel it. My rent's still going up. My bills are still going up. My fuel prices are still going up. It's exactly the same thing in, in the US. The great irony is in the US, it's slightly less bad than it is in Europe. So we over in Europe kind of look at America, we look at their growth, we look at their inflation, we look at all of that stuff and we're like, oh, you guys, honestly, you don't know how good you've got it. But frankly, if you're trying to subsist and you're just trying to make do and try and keep, keep your finances in order and be able to afford the food you need for you and your family, your children and so on, that is not getting any easier. In fact, it's getting tougher because inflation is just a measure of how fast prices are rising the fact that they're rising a bit less quickly than they were before, that's kind of neither here nor there, given they've gone up by, you know, 20, 30 percent in the last few years. None of which, none of which, Ed, is to suggest that politicians on either side of the Atlantic won't be crowing about their achievements if they hit their, their inflation targets. I mean, certainly, look, Andrew Bailey, you know, acknowledges this as a good thing. Rishi Sunak is looking at it as a, as a potential tool for, for a future election. And you mentioned, you know, the publication of the data come April. I mean, if inflation gets to his 2% target, you know, he will certainly be using that in, in an election campaign. I suppose the, the question is, when you look at the Eurozone and inflation there is 2.4%, France 24 Germany 23 how much credit Rishi Sunak, A, can personally take for what is going on, and B, whether or not actually we are in a good place when you look across the channel. I can understand why the government wants to take credit, but the, the, the reality is it is mostly the Bank of England's job to try and deal with inflation. And so the main force bringing that down has been interest rates. Though I suppose it's, it's fair that the government hasn't been splurging in a particular way that is inflationary. But yeah, broadly speaking, I think that, that there are bigger forces here. And I think that's the important thing to remember. You know, when the UK faced this energy price shock, it wasn't just because of UK policy, it was because energy prices around the world were going up so fast. It's because we are a big energy importer and we depend on gas imported from overseas and those gas prices, guess what? They just went up really quickly. So we are in a tempestuous sea at the moment and so are many other countries around the world. The good news, okay, with this inflation shock, a lot of people were worried early on that higher prices that people were paying was gonna trigger this inflationary spiral as they call it. So. Inflation goes up, the price that you're paying at the supermarket goes up, you demand a higher salary from your, from your boss, understandably, reasonably so, they put up your earnings and then you have this, this spiral. Not that wages haven't gone up a bit, but it doesn't look like they've got out of control. However, other commentators that I have been looking at this morning have pointed to wage inflation. They've pointed to inflation in the services sector. If inflation in both of those areas remains strong, isn't it? just possible, Ed, that there might be some point in the not too distant future when we are not talking about central bank interest cuts, but instead we're talking about the Bank of England perhaps hiking again. Where interest rates are right now, 5.25%, as far as they see it, even though even if interest rates stayed at 5.25%, they are still actively pushing the brake pedal on the UK economy right now. In other words, you know, would they actually need to hike interest rates or would they need to just leave interest rates a little bit higher for a bit longer? I think, you know, the latter is, is more likely. They would just kind of leave them a bit higher. But is there not something of a symbiotic relationship between the central banks of big Western economies like the United States and the United Kingdom? If the Fed holds off on cutting interest rates and we go ahead with it, I mean, what does that do to the pound? I mean, everyone, in essence, is shadowing what the Federal Reserve does. So, you know, there was that old phrase about when, when the US sneezes, the rest of the world catches colds. So even now, everyone is just looking towards, you know, Jay Powell, the head of the Federal Reserve, to try and work out what they're going to do. And frankly, whatever they do, 
we'll probably end up doing the same thing a few months later. Or maybe we'll do it like one month before, but it's kind of because it's clear that they're heading in that direction as well. Because like you say, this is where a lot of the big monetary force around the world is. And, and, and actually on that front, it's a similar story. Not that, well, not that long ago, the, the head of the Federal Reserve was saying, probably we're going to be cutting interest rates soon. And now he's saying, or giving the signal, maybe not so sure it's going to be so soon. It's the same thing on both sides of the Atlantic. And it's quite nervy, I think. Look, I mean, I have to admit, I do not know exactly where the International Monetary Fund building is, but I suspect that not too far away from it, you've probably got some pretty decent shopping opportunities. Uh, Clearly, in this country, people will be focusing on, you know, how much money they have in their pockets. All this grand macroeconomic theory is, is fascinating stuff for you and I to talk about, but, but ultimately people want to know how much disposable income they're going to have and you know, retailers want to know if they're going to be coming in and spending it. What do you think that the, kind of the, 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 the effect of what we are seeing, you know, where you are and, and what has happened at the Bank of England today, what effect, if any, that will have on the metaphorical high street? That's a good question. I, I think things are starting gradually to improve in terms of spending. And, and people in the UK still have a little bit of saving left over from the pandemic to spend. An interesting difference between the US and the UK is that the US essentially spent nearly all of their pandemic savings. Whereas we in the UK, we didn't spend it. All. Some of it got inflated away, frankly, but we didn't, we didn't spend it all. And that means, you know, there is this wall of money, not maybe not as big as people would like, but there's a bit of a wall of money that's kind of waiting there for people to make purchases. So I think there is still an optimistic kind of view of the next few years. But the problem is there's just a lot of scary things going on out there in the global economy and in diplomacy, making that story just a little bit more nerve wracking than it was before. Ed, thank you. In a moment, we'll continue to focus on the economy and on retail in particular. Back soon. Welcome back. So, inflation is down and expected to drop further, meaning that whilst the price of stuff is still increasing, it's not increasing anywhere near as quickly as it was. Say, for example, in March 2023, when food inflation was running at a staggering 19.1%. But what does this mean for retailers and, of course, all of us that shop? As mentioned, ASOS has seen a massive drop in UK sales. British brand Superdry faces administration if it doesn't get its house in order sharpish. So will these inflation figures have any positive effect? Uh, Russ Mould is Investment Director at AJ Bell and he joins us on The Daily. Let's start, if we can, with ASOS. Their sales down year on year, 16% in the United Kingdom. Do they describe it as a, as a difficult consumer backdrop uh, having an effect on what, what they themselves describe as, as the young ASOS demographic? What does that mean? What specifically about the way in which the UK economy is going, where wages are going, where disposable income is going at the moment has had this effect? I mean, ASOS is a global player. So it's got, it sells to, the U, to Europe, the US as well. But if you look at what's retailing all about, it's about right product, right price, right format. And if you nail it, like Next has done, for example then you can continue to make really, really good money in this market. Where's ASOS being tripped up? Well, I guess it's got the right format because it's online, so it's down to product and perhaps down to price. And then you're looking at things like competition. You have Sheen and Temu who are snapping in its heels. Now, they're probably a slightly different price point, a lower price point, dare I say, but in straight in times, you can understand why shoppers would perhaps look at that. There probably has been some change in consumer tests. I mean, our daughter, she's much more into vintage and other areas, and she's she's very much more of a Gen Z type less conspicuous consumption, more curated, buying perhaps better, but less, she would argue. And you also have scrutiny on ISOs, not just for its cost base, more and more consumers are looking from an environmental point of view or a social point of view. Some of their goods are clearly very competitively priced. And I think some shoppers are looking at the sourcing of that. You know, they're not using sweated labour and they'll check very carefully for that and deny allegations of that, just as Boohoo has done. But even if you're paying minimum wage in some of these countries, There'll be people not having a very great time there. And I think some shoppers are increasingly aware of that as well. See, Russell, I will admit that this is fascinating to me because on the one hand, you have rampant wage inflation, according to the kind of the, the frothier at the mouth financial analysts. And, and yet 
people don't seem to be spending it in the ways in which they would have traditionally. I mean, you mentioned uh, Vinted there. There are other resale sites uh, available. I'm currently wearing a jacket that I picked up off one of those sites. And I, I, I like to think of myself as one of those who, who, who does pretty well, who has a, enough money in the bank. Even my kind of consumer tastes have changed as a result of, I think, a combination of factors, perhaps peer pressure, but also the economic outlook as well. No, I think, and you can see some of this in, in ASOS's numbers. I mean, in the end, that, that that frightening sales drop figure that you said, the good news from the stock market's point of view was it was no worse than expected. Mm. And the company had already flagged it. And they've stuck to some of their longer term targets for profitability and cash flow. And they've actually got some of their inventory mountain down. But if you look at some of the, the day-to-day operating metrics of the company in terms of site visits, shipment numbers, cost, regular customer users, they're down. And the average basket size is broadly flat, which again, at a time when you say inflation has been running at 5 6% on average, suggests that customers are being careful uh, and they're either cutting back on volume or cutting back on price or both. Let's talk about another retailer, Superdrive, what, what for many years was considered to be a, a real British success story. Started out in a, a market stall in Cheltenham with, with what I'm told was just a, a first run of five different T-shirts all the way to the stock exchange. But now they're delisting. I mean, first and foremost, just explain what delisting means uh, for our audience and why this absolute behemoth of, of, of British retail seems to be struggling at the moment. Public company means that the shares are traded on the stock market and owned by the public, whether it's pension funds or private individuals. Private company means there are no shares to trade on the stock market and it's controlled by an individual or an entity. And in this case, it seems as if the the founder and long-term shareholder, Mr. Julian Dunkerton, that he's going to be putting money into the company to try and get it back onto a, onto a healthier basis, but then buying up all of the shares and taking them off the stock market so he can get on with a job of turning it around in private without having to report quarterly numbers or interim numbers, six monthly figures to shareholders who might be prodding and wanting, you know, wanting faster progress. Yeah, well, you, you mean, you look at the share price at 1.500 pence all the way down to, to five. I mean, that, that, that represents a, a huge collapse, not just in the value of the company, but in the confidence that, that the market has in the company. Where did they go wrong? What can unseat any company? It's competition, it's regulation, it's changes in customer tastes and, it, and, it, and it's debt. And I think super dry change in customer taste has been a big issue there. You could almost argue super dry was a victim of its own phenomenal success. I mean, it, started, you know, it really began to get big a, because of Julian Dunkerton's, you know, kind of mashup designs between preppy style and Japanese uh, glamour. And then David Beckham was an early model for them. And, and lo and behold, the thing went intergalactic. But when, and this is no disrespect, and this is from somebody who was 55, when you start seeing, you know, grandmothers and grandparents wearing this stuff in the park, well, the cool kids don't really want to wear it anymore. The management team that took over clearly struggled to maintain momentum. He's now back in, and I guess now it's very much up to him. You know, what's the next move for what was, as you say, an innovative, dynamic, exciting young brand? And I'm sure that's what he's going to look to try and make it again out of the public glare for a bit so he can crack on and try and turn the company around. To what extent... Does what we have heard today away from the retail sector, those those inflation figures and and the effect they may have on the Bank of England, to what extent is what happens next of, of pivotal importance to companies like ASOS, like Superdry? Yeah, it definitely will be. I mean, at the moment, for those people who are in a job and employment levels are historically pretty high, things actually aren't so bad at the moment because wage growth is comfortably running ahead of the headline inflation figure. Equally, you dig into that headline inflation figure and the 6% odd year-on-year increase in owner home occupier costs, you know, rent and mortgages and, and, and bills, that's not very funny. And that is still putting pressure on people. So mm. it, it would be good to see inflation cool further towards the Bank of England's 2% target. It's been above that for the thick end of three years. And where the Bank of England takes rates going forward will be very important because it affects how much people pay on their credit card, their car loans, and ultimately further down the road, their mortgage. The tricky bit for the Bank of England is what it's really trying to do is set the cost of money, not for today, but for two, three years' time, mm. because that's when people's mortgages roll over and that's when you get the real the, the real impact. So that's the science of it, magic, art of it. So, so just to, to generalise about the retail sector right now, it is a mixed bag in terms of who is up and who is down. And if we are hearing from number 10, number 11 Downing Street, that we are out of the woods that that might just be a little bit premature. 
there are always winners and losers in any industry, even if it's going well. But right now, I think retail is still a very difficult environment. And if you look at what we saw from, say, the the UK quoted recruitment companies this week, you know, they're showing year on year drops in net fee income at the moment. A lot of nerves among candidates. You know, is it the right time to change? Because I might be, you know, first, you know, last in, first out if things go wrong. Um, and employees are holding back because they're just a little bit concerned as to maybe the political environment, what's going to happen after the election and where interest rates are going. So there is a little bit of a hiatus there. I think the headline GDP numbers do suggest that we are, quote, turning the corner and everybody's hoping so. And you've always got to be careful. You don't want to talk things down because, you know, recessions can be as much psychological as physical. But it, I think it, it is still a very, very finely balanced picture. And if, heaven forbid, the oil price were to say rocket for any unexpected reason, that would be a major setback from both an inflation and a growth point of view. So there are lots of moving parts still here to keep an eye on. There certainly are. Russ Mould, great to talk to you. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. So, admittedly with caveats, the rate of inflation dropping is good news for the economy. No doubt the government will take some credit for this, although the Governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, has responsibility. But as ASOS, Superdry and plenty of others show, inflation is but one bright spot on a very murky economic snapshot. That's your lot for this edition of The Daily. We'll see you again soon.